Hi, and welcome to another Shopee Farm Show Quarantine Edition. I am so pleased today to have Dr. Ria with me. It's not going to just be me uh, alone on my stool, which I think is good for everybody. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, I've not interviewed someone uh, like this before, except for jobs. So this is a little bit new uh, for me, but I think there is a lot of good information. There's some housekeeping things I want to discuss, but I'm going to save them for the end of the video, kind of about what's going on with the farm and what we're doing uh, around town. But I don't want to delay getting into this video. If you get that far, I hope you uh, listen to it. Um, so without further ado, here is Dr. Rio. All right. Good morning. My name is Ben Edwards. I'm a partner at the Shopee Farm. This is our third video. And I was hoping to improve the video quality of production here each time, but we're going to degrade a bit here. This one's going to be a little worse because of the new social uh, distancing policies put in, in place by the state. We're going to do this via Zoom, so we're going to do it remotely. The good part is I have my dear friend, Dr. Rio, who's going to join me. It's not going to just be a fireside monologue. We're going to have a little conversation about what's going on. I'm going to ask some questions and uh, hopefully we're going to learn a few things. So welcome, Dr. Rio. Thank you so much for, for joining me. It's a pleasure Thank to you. see you. Um, so just a quick little bit of background about uh, Dr. Rio. He moved to Machias about well, over 30 years ago after serving uh, as a physician in the U.S. Navy. Dr. Rio has been my family doctor uh, as long as I can remember, or my friend, uh, and obviously a physician, family physician to many people in Down East Maine. Um, he's also a partner on the Shopee Farm uh, and the co-medical director, so I, we see each other a lot, or we used to. Um, <laughs> he's also a hell of a cook, uh, and I hope to get to a couple of things with that later on. He's also a pretty good tractor driver. Uh, which spring is coming. We're going to put that to use here pretty quickly. Um, and I'll also include some contact information in the notes in case you want to ask some questions. Maybe we can do a follow-up video uh, a little bit later on. So welcome to our little show here. <laughs> Dr. Thank Leo. You. And first of all, um, thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for taking care of my family. Uh, we've had a bit more uh, need of your services lately. Than usual, Dr. Rio is the one that administered our, or his, his office administered my wife and our uh, coronavirus test, which was most unpleasant, but um, thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for taking care of my family and, uh, and you know, thank you for taking care of the community. I feel much safer in these very uncertain times knowing you, uh, you are making sure I behave properly. <laughs> so, um, I guess where I wanted to start is, so uh, my wife and I have been in one form of isolation or another for almost 10 weeks. It's crazy when I uh, kind of was doing some research on, on what I wanted to talk to you about. So uh, we were gone for four weeks, but the coronavirus pandemic was on people's minds uh, when we were in Europe. So we limited our activity quite a bit. We didn't go out all that much. And then uh, we came home and at your recommendation, we did the what ended up being 16 days of full on uh, quarantine. And then we finished up our quarantine just in time for really kind of the rest of the, of the United States to, to lock down. So I've been very isolated for almost 10 weeks. You have not, um, you still have to go to work. You still see a lot of patients every day. I was hoping we could start with you just kind of talking to me about what your day looks like right now. So in the, the last two weeks, it's, um, it's changed quite a bit. We, we were seeing patients uh, right along basically because um, the way we normally had been up until about two weeks ago, because the virus really hadn't hit Maine very um, hard. And only up until um, two, a few days ago did we have our first positive case here in Washington County. So my office was running pretty much like it normally ran um, up to about two weeks ago. And then when we started having uh, social distancing, we tried to um, only have um, acute visits and patients who absolutely needed to, to be in the office. Um, we um, have also restricted guests 
uh, from coming with patients. So if, um, if the elderly need a ride, um, then we get them into the building and have their ride go wait in the car. So we limit the amount of people coming into the office. Um, we, we try to stagger patients so they don't go into the waiting room. Um, they come right into the exam room and um, try to keep it down um, to this little contact with personnel as we possibly can. We're not shifting paper across the, um, the check-in desk anymore. We're asking for verbal consents rather than having them to sign uh, paperwork and, and try, just trying to limit contact with uh, inanimate objects that the patient has come in contact with or what we've come in contact with. Um, we've eliminated like all the magazines from the waiting room. The, the waiting room is pretty much cleaned a couple of times a day, wiped down, even though um, patients are not really going into the waiting room. It's so very rare that we have someone in there. Um, and we are um, cleaning each room after each patient um, pretty uh, dramatically. Um, we've always wiped down, you know, the common services that patients touch between patients, but we're doing it uh, much more vigorously now, wiping down pretty much the whole room uh, that the patient may, may uh, come in contact with. We also, this last uh, week, have started doing uh, more telemedicine. Um, the, the federal government uh, guideline, CMS, um, which is the controller of Medicare and Medicaid, have, uh, let's just say, loosened their rules regarding um, how telemedicine can be conducted. And they've also extended the ability to get reimbursed um, from the visits. Um, which has made it a lot easier and you know nicer for patients that really don't um, need a lot of contact. Um, so, so those visits are really good for patients who you know, need to follow up their hypertension or their diabetes and they can basically just give me um, you know, how they're feeling and the numbers that they have accumulated, whether it's their blood sugars or their blood pressure. And so those visits, um, we can still get a lot out of the visit. I can still give a lot of advice. Um, I can see the patient to see, you know, on the video to see how they're, they look to me, whether they're, um, you know, look healthy enough. And I just obviously reinforce the, the social distancing and reinforcing, you know, washing their hands and just all the recommendations by the CDC. So, so that's how it's changed right now. It's also, um, my day is, not as busy as it used to be, uh, basically because I am limiting uh, patients coming that are coming to the to the office. Um, but the the telemedicine is going to be a big changer because before we, we could video conference, I was doing a lot of phone um, uh, messaging um, and trying to talk to patients over the phone. And it's so much better to to see the patient and how they're reacting. Um, so. I think it's going to it's going to be a big game changer in this um, period of time uh, for us how we're doing care and probably you know going going forward after we get out on the other side of this um, people will probably become much more comfortable in the past with telemedicine um, you know a lot of the time it was with um, remote physicians or remote consultants that people didn't really know so they didn't feel comfortable but um, now with being able to video conference with with my own patients i think i'm going to get them much more comfortable with how to do it and 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 seeing how much they like it so that's good fun. i mean that's that's one of the things that i wanted to to talk about at some point you've already discussed a couple of the things one is i kind of wanted to know how you were protecting yourself and your staff and and you've talked about that but uh, one of the things that I also want to talk about is whether you thought some of these changes that you have put in place are going to be durable. And it sounds like they are. So it sounds like you probably will continue to do some of this remote meeting uh, with your patients going forward, even after this is kind of uh, hopefully resolved. Right. I, I, I mean, I like, um, I like being able to, to do it this way, especially, I mean, we live in a big county and some people, you know, drive 45 minutes, um, 
And a lot of times, um, you know, in inclement weather, we, we have massive cancellations. And so to be able to have this in, um, in a format that patients may get used to, it may be better in the winter instead of putting people on the roads um, in dangerous conditions to come to see me, that I might be able to do it this way too. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great uh, learning tool. I think we're gonna probably benefit uh, from, from that aspect of it anyway. That's nice. That was another thing. I was hoping to find some positive things that we could take away from this. So it's nice to hear this. We got one already. That's yeah. good. <laughs> um, I guess another thing, and this is really just a, a personal uh, question because I just see so few people these days um, and you are still seeing quite a few. Are you seeing any um, patterns or uh, like common themes in people's uh, thoughts and behaviors on what's going on? And I kind of mean like um, I mean, my my uh, entire exposure has been like two trips to the grocery store in two weeks. Um, and things seemed quite tense a couple of weeks ago, but the, when we went last, or I went last week, uh, it, it seemed like people were kind of settling into this situation that we find ourselves in. Are you finding that uh, people feel that way? Are there more stressed or less stressed? Or uh, any thoughts on just kind of some common uh, attitudes to what is what we're going through? Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel that patients are understanding it a little better as time goes on. They really were not um, looking at it as a real situation two weeks ago. But yeah. I mean, I think in the last two weeks, when people are watching the amount of deaths um, pile up in New York City and seeing how, um, how this is affected and the fact that Governor Mills has basically sent us home, um, they're, they're kind of seeing the, the, they're understanding it better. And I think they're paying much better attention to it and, um, and, and seeing the changes, even like when, when you go to the grocery store and you see the, the plexiglass in front of the, um, the, uh, the, the cashiers and, um, the pharmacies having their plastic, um, down around them. Um, and, and this, um, I mean, it's going to all change again when we're all wearing masks. Um, and so I, I, I think it's really on everyone's mind. When, they, when, when I'm seeing patients, regular patients in the office, I'm um, trying to figure out how they're doing with the isolation. And, um, you know, they're all, you know, worried, but they all are saying stay home, which is not a terribly unusual thing in, in, um, Washington County, where we live, where a lot of people stay at home most of the winter. I think we're all getting kind of tired of it um, because we all are inside most of the time. And um, with inclement weather, we don't travel very much. And so, um, I mean, I think, I think people are used to being homebodies in Washington County. So it's not that, that bad. I, I think a lot of people miss um, the, 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 the physical contact. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, there was many times, um, you know, with, with seeing my patients that, you know, we'd end the offices with a hug or a handshake, um, and all of that. And, and unfortunately that has, has not occurred. And, um, I know, um, I know I have, I have a lot of widow, widows who, who come in and, who either live alone or you know, they're octogenarians and um, they're, you know, have very limited um, social contact. They have very limited physical contact and it's always um, been nice to come in there. They, and, you know, a lot of times it's just talking. I mean, I think they come to the office just so they can have a social interaction and, mm -hmm. um, which is a great thing. I think it's part of healing and health. And it's very healthy to have that. And so they are missing that ability to have that contact, um, and which, which is the unfortunate part of this. Tough. And very yeah. tough to replace right now. And that's, that's one thing I do want to get to at some point. Like we've been kind of talking about the practical, physical changes and then of course there's all the whole other psychological side of things which i would like to talk about it at some point but before we leave the the physical things 
there are a lot of other essential workers like yourself who have to continue to be out. They, they come in contact with a lot of people every day. And I just wondered if you don't mind if you would speak to how you are protecting your family and your loved ones, given that you have so much contact. So there are a lot of other people in that position um, where maybe their family is quarantined, but they are having to be out in contact with a lot of other people, like say the people that work at the shop and save or, or, or something like that. So can you speak to that a little bit, like how you are managing this at home? Right. Um... So I, I manage it from the time I leave. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly washing my hands, uh, which is basically where a lot of the contact can happen. And I mean, we're trained as, as medical professionals to always do that. I mean, I am doing it 10 times more than I usually do, which was quite a bit to begin with. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing that. Um, I'm also wearing, um, for the first time, I think in my, in my career here in Machias, uh, my white lab coat, uh, basically to protect my clothes so I can leave that at the office and not bring that home. Um, I am um, always wiping wiping things down. I, I both. I, I only have one person here, my wife, when I come home, and um, I, I'm very conscientious of making sure I wash and do all of that stuff. But in the office, I, I am trying to maintain a six foot different distance. Um, unfortunately, you know, obviously I have to examine patients and I get within their space. But, um, you know, I, I, I am trying to be as, um, as professional and as I can without garbing up for every patient. I mean, obviously that's not appropriate, especially in trying to conserve um, PPE when, when we need it. Um, so, so you know, I, we, we, we can't do that. Um, probably with the mask wearing uh, recommendations, we probably will put on masks this week um, to be in the office uh, in that kind of contact. Um, so, so that, I, and, and it will just be regular surgical masks. It won't be N95s. Um, okay. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, well, and that's that's one thing I did want to ask you about. So there is this new guidance from the CDC as of uh, sometime this past week about uh, everyone wearing some kind of mask when we're out in public and we're in a space where it's very difficult to maintain the six foot uh, distance around you, like in the grocery store. There are some officials that are saying that they are not going to do that. And then there are some that are saying they are. Can you speak to what your thoughts are on that for one thing? And then the other is, of course, um, I know that the medical establishment is short on masks. So it seems a bit irresponsible for, uh, for us, the general public, to be wearing the higher quality masks when we're out. Should we be uh, making a mask ourselves and conserving the, the more medical grade ones, uh, and maybe donating them? So I guess, can you speak to those two things? Sure. So, so the wearing of the mask is not so much protecting yourself, but protecting others, because they're saying that now the virus, um, although transmitted mostly from droplets, can also be aerosolized. And so talking um, and can put it out into the, the atmosphere. And, you know, if, if it's within... If you're not within the six feet, it's probably not a, a big thing, but you know, the virus hangs out for a long time. So putting a mask on prevents shed from your mouth, not coming into your mouth. Um, and so the, you know, wearing a cloth bandana um, is probably adequate to prevent that from happening. Um, the mask, the N95s and the, you know, the, the more highly, uh, used mass that we've been hearing about obviously protects um, the passage of, of uh, particles into um, the wearer's uh, oral mucosa, nasal mucosa. And so, but those masks, if anyone's ever worn those masks, you, you know that they're not the most comfortable thing to wear for a long period of time. Um, they are occlusive, so you can't have gaps and you can't go through them. Um, when, when we all get fitted for them in the, in the medical profession, we have, um, 
we, we have fit testing to see if it is completely occlusive. And so the way they do that is they put you in a mask that they figure is the right size for you and they, they put this hood over you and that's airtight. And then they squirt in this, um, this kind of like sugary aerosol kind of thing. And you're supposed to tell, a, tell the, the examiner if, if you can taste it. Okay, you taste this sweet kind of saccharine taste. Um, and, um, and if you can't, if you can't smell it, then the mask is fitting properly. And, you know, so you're not going to get um, particles coming through. And so, um, so those masks are highly effective in protecting people who are in direct contact with coronavirus or, or other viruses. So, so those masks are, are highly sought after, especially for medical personnel who are going to come in direct contact. And those are the masks you see when people are doing the testing, like when they came out to, to test you, they were all in full garb, basically, because we didn't know. And so when testing can happen uh, on a more um, broad spectrum, I mean, we're going to start, hopefully, we're going to start seeing that happen soon. So. Okay. So for, for the general public, wear a bandana, wear a mask. It's, it's not for you. It's for everybody else. It's such an active public service. Put it on. Right. That's the, that's the takeaway. All right. Yeah. Well, because we're, you know, the asymptomatic uh, transmission is um, supposedly pretty high. Um, and so <laughs> you don't know who has it. And that's basically what the recommendations are coming out for now. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, one case that we have in, in Washington County here. Um, can you, I mean, obviously, everyone, uh, medical establishment included, is, has been anticipating it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. But can you maybe talk to me a little bit about, um, and you have some already, uh, how prepared we are uh, or how prepared you are and the, the local medical establishment, what has been going on over these last few weeks? While we haven't had a case, uh, are we ready? What you know? What 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 have we been doing to kind of get ready for this? Uh, well, obviously, getting ready is you know the social distancing and trying to stay away from people. I mean, I think that's the most appropriate and most um, beneficial way to get ready for this. Um, because if it really, if we can really limit the amount of uh, people getting this and getting seriously ill then we are going to come out of it on the other side a lot better. Obviously, everyone's read about lessening the curve, and, and, and basically it's to try to prevent um, a lot of patients getting it at the same time and really inundating the hospital system. Um, so as far as what the hospital is doing, obviously we have supplies and we're trying to get more supplies and and the uh, CDC the main CDC has been shipping supplies to hospitals and, and first responders um, and so so that's all been great um, we have um, at this hospital I think we have four ventilators um, if if that's correct I'm, I'm, I'm not terribly sure but normally this hospital is a critical access hospital doesn't take care of those kind of intense um, patients. Um, we just don't have the staff. We don't have pulmonologists. We don't have cardiologists. Um, and so a lot of times when we get patients that are that sick, they get shipped to the tertiary hospital, which is Bangor. Okay. And so um, the, the, the problem will be is when and if Bangor becomes saturated with um, those intense um, care patients and we're not allowed to ship or they don't have room for, for those patients. I mean, this, this happens quite a, a lot basically because hospital beds throughout America have been decreasing for some time. And so um, a lot of times during, um, during the, the cold season or uh, influenza season, um, Patients, you know, Bangor is full and we either have to divert to, to Portland if they have big capabilities or other hospitals. And so this that may happen really quickly. And so 
we may have to take care of really sick patients here at this hospital. And the hospital um, medical staff is gearing up a, a four member team um, to be um, on call. So that would consist of a hospitalist who is used to taking care of patients in the hospital, a surgeon um, who may have to be called to put in IV lines or central lines or um, more complicated lines, and uh, an anesthesiologist to come and help um, either intubate the patient or um, do lines that, that are necessary to monitor those patients. And then there's also going to be a primary care doctor who would be available to help back up um, the hospitalist um, in case we have, I mean, one patient on a ventilator takes up pretty much all your time. If we had four people on ventilators, um, you know, the hospitalist would, would be um, quite inundated with the amount of work, especially if we had to, we have, we have a basically um, a 20, two bed capacity at our hospital. Okay. Okay. But so obviously it sounds like there's been already a lot of planning and preparation and uh, we're yes. as ready as we can be. Right. So we're, and it sounds like, be, and hopefully it's not, uh, I mean, you know, if we can keep it to one patient on a ventilator at a time, I think we, we will do very well. But, and it, obviously it sounds like we're very used to the, because of the type of hospital we are, we're very used to the transferring of patients to the to the, the bigger hospital in Bangor. So these are all mechanisms that have been in place previously and are very comfortable uh, for yep. the staff. And right. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, uh, let's let's talk about the psychological part here a little bit. I mean, uh, we've talked about the practical. Um, I can't remember living with this kind of just chronic stress. I mean, I feel, I can't remember my psychology very well, but I think it would be called like anticipatory trauma. I feel like we're kind of uh, at the beginning of this little horror film and the scene is set and the characters are all in place and you know things are about to get bad, but they aren't yet. Um, the stress is at least uh, for me, it's, I'm pretty stressed uh, <laughs> just as like a, a baseline. So. What are you doing to stay sane? How, how, what do you think we should be doing? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think, um, I mean, it, I think you, what my big recommendation is, and I try to do this quite frequently, is put down your phone, put down, you know, the total constant news feed, always watching things. Um, you know, um, you know, we, we have had war through Afghanistan and um, Iraq for, you know, almost 20 years now. And, um, you know, a lot of people have been divorced of that. I mean, other than if you've not been in the military or if you don't have um, a loved one in the military, it's kind of, a lot of Americans have not had that, um, that anxiety over war. I mean, I remember living through, you know, the, the main part of, of Vietnam and the escalations and the Tet Offensive and, you know, watching that on television, which was all you had at the time, um, and, and um, how everyone was glued to their television sets, you know, when the news came on regarding the Vietnam War. And, be, and because of the draft, it really was, the last time, um, you know, all of America was involved in a big crisis because it really affected every single person. And I can remember living through that and having the anxiety of friends going off to, to war and, and relatives doing that and um, not knowing if they were going to come back. I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to that. I mean, I, my feeling, because, you know, I, I have those memories, I, I have that. Um, and I'm trying to not anticipate in what is going to happen here. Um, my hope has always been from the beginning that we would um, have it to a lesser degree because of the rural um, area that we're in. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we're going to escape it because we're far away from everyone. 
Um, but we have been putting this social distancing in probably longer than most people have um, because you, we listened early and we didn't have many cases. So maybe, just maybe, we're, we're going to not have it as bad as some of you saw. That's, a, that's really still a hope. But as far as how I deal with that, um, that anxiety of going out and coming in contact with, um, you know, roughly 30 to 50 people every single day when I'm supposed to be socially um, away from them and not coming into their space. It's, um, I mean, you know, it is my job and I, I accept that responsibility and I accepted it a long time ago when I was young and, and you know, have volunteered to help the hospital basically because it's my community, it's my job, and I, I have the knowledge to be able to help, uh, and so I'm going to do that. I feel sorry for the people who are, who are kind of forced to work at, at Hannaford or some of the stores um, that are really not necessarily um, prepared to do that and have very little protection against the exposure that they're having. Um, I know I've read um, some um, articles just recently that Hannaford, ex um, Hannaford employees down in the Scarborough, Portland area are becoming positive for coronavirus. And so I, I, I feel that those patients probably have a lot more anxiety than healthcare workers, knowing that they're out there, knowing that they're still getting their minimum wage, still probably don't have health insurance, um, you know, and are not getting any hazard pay. Not that we're getting hazard pay either, but um, you know we're uh, we're we're out there, and that's that's a way to you know it's hard to lessen that stress. Yeah, and like you said, also I guess it's something you accept being in the medical profession that you are going to expose yourself to to things uh, here and there, and certainly uh, more so in times like this. So uh, that is that certainly is something. I'm also just thinking about like I. I am so isolated. I'm not personally particularly worried myself, but I, I'm worried about everything else that's going on. I'm worried about my father and my uncle who are older. I'm worried about uh, the economy. I mean, it's just that there's so much uh, just residual stress everywhere. Uh, uh, but I, I like the, the turn off the phone, turn off the TV thing. Like we, we actually had that discussion in the house last week that like just enough with the news. Like it's just. I mean, I, I, I have to stay informed about, you know, a lot of stuff. And, and I'm not saying turn it off and don't pay attention and hide your head in the sand. I'm saying just right. don't do it all day long. And I mean, yeah, so cut it down. To see what's new or how many people have died or, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, we have to follow it, but to just shut it off and do something else, like go outside, go for a walk, go for, um, you know, read something different <laughs> than your phone, um, yeah. you know, so watch a movie, <laughs> have, dinner, have dinner, have a glass of wine. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's talk about something a little more fun here. Um, Allison, my wife, loves, and I were talking about the cooking thing, loves this CBD honey of yours. Can you really quickly, and I'll put the recipe in the, in the notes, but can you tell me how you do that? So it's really pretty simple. Um, if you have a slow cooker or um, a crock pot, um, which is, <laughs> I, I have this crock pot that I hardly ever use, uh, and I think I got it as a wedding present, you know, 40 years ago, <laughs> and I dug it out from the basement and um, because I read a recipe about how to make um, honey infused CBD or honey infused um, THC. And so, um, so you, you get an ounce of C, you know, CBD product or marijuana and uh, decarboxylate it by putting it in the oven for um, 220, I think that's right. We'll have to look that up. Two, I think it's 220 for an hour. Um, and, um, and then you let it cool and you break it up pretty good. Um, I use the grind, a coffee grinder, but I think the next time I'm not going to do that because, um, 
I read somewhere that it's probably better just to break it up with your fingers or with the scissors. Um, I think, uh, I can't remember the reason why, but I, I think it, it doesn't degenerate as much. But, and so I did that and then um, I, I wrapped the ounce um, in some cheesecloth, like double layered cheesecloth. And I put um, about 16 ounces of honey in the crock pot on low. And I just emerged this sausage like <laughs> container of cheesecloth, a, a, a cheesecloth container of uh, CBD into that and just let it stay kept on for about eight hours. And that's it. It's pretty simple. That is pretty simple. It's very popular over here. <laughs> good. <laughs> that's cool. Okay. So we'll, we'll put those uh, very, that's, that's a good simple recipe. I can do that. We'll put those in the notes. Um, I mean, I think, I think we've covered quite a bit. I think that like we've, we've hit on the things that were most uh, or that I most wanted to, to talk about. Is there anything in particular you feel like that's really important that we should discuss that we haven't? I, I think um, I, I have patients calling saying, how can we help? How, you know, you know, they found a, an N95 mask that they've had put away um, and they're asking if, if I can use it and, <laughs> and and I say absolutely. I mean, we can all use that kind of stuff. But the most help that um, that I would like to get out there is that you know, stay healthy, stay away, um, eat well. Um, you know, stay away from us. You know, we're we're going to be really really busy. And if if you can pay attention to your diabetes, pay attention to your hypertension, just pay attention to your health, and not just sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day. Um, while you're at home, um, do things that are, are healthy for you, you know, create some healthy food, um, go out for a walk, concentrate on your health during this time. It probably will go a long way in helping us all. And so we're talking about not staying away from the coronavirus. We're talking about everything else, like just maintain your, your general health and well-being, so that you don't have to come into the medical, to you, to the medical establishment for something else like, uh, like your diabetes or a broken arm or a, or whatever, just just do the best that we can to stay to stay away uh, from right. needing medical care. Right. I think we'll all get we'll all get through this. Um, it's just trying to get to the other side, and we can't really imagine what it is because we don't know how long it's going to be. And I and I think that's what's wearing on a lot of people's mind: how long is this going to take? And yeah. um, I, I wish, as a medical professional, we, we knew when that was going to be. I think when we see more testing happening, I mean, right now, we in America have tested less than half a percent of the population, which is pretty, almost criminal, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, we should have been testing a long time ago. We should have been testing. We should be mounting up the testing every single day. They keep saying we're going to be doing more and more testing, but you know, to help only test it after you know being in this. I mean, you're you've been in isolation for over ten weeks. To only have tested, you know, a, a half of a percent of the population is is pretty bad. We need to be testing more. We need to just do good epidemiology, which is test. If you're positive, you go into isolation. We come. We we come and get all your contacts and all those people that you're in contact are in isolation until and they're tested to see if they're positive. Um, that's how we're going to, that's how we're really, really going to limit this. It's just, you know, unfortunate. Yeah, and I mean that the testing is our data and what you're saying is really, we're just not going to have any visibility into what we're into and how long we're going to be in it until we get this testing ramped up and really can see what's going on. Right, we will see, you know, once, once they give us okay to start testing people, we're gonna see the numbers go up. That's, I mean, it's really easy to, to see that that's gonna happen, but at least we'll know, you know, what part of the population has this and, you know, how we go about doing it. And I think, you know, you, you, you talked about the economy. I think that is the one way that how we're going to open up the economy again. I mean, this whole yeah. idea of, you know, we're going to open it up at the end of April. Well, we have no idea we're going to open it up in the, at the end of April because we don't have 
the data unless we can get a whole lot of people tested within the month, which I don't see happening until you know we get more tests um, available to us. But that's one way we're going to be able to open the economy because we'll be able to keep those people away from other people who are tested positive rather than just this, oh, everyone's a possibility. <laughs> so stay at home. Right, which is where we are right now, which is just stay at home unless you absolutely can't. And that's that's a tough, tough way to run a country for a long period of time. So hopefully, hopefully we get some more testing going. But okay. Anything else? Okay. I hope. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Let's wrap it up then. Dave, okay. thank you so much. It was I learned a lot. Um, I think a lot of people will learn a lot by watching this. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll put some information in the show notes in case anybody has questions. Maybe we can do a, a follow-up or something like that if you're willing. Um, sure. Okay, great. So I think that's it. We're going to put our masks on, or I am, and I'm going to try and stay healthy, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. If you've made it this far, I'm shocked, uh, but thank you. A couple of housekeeping things that I mentioned at the beginning of the video I want to kind of follow up on. One is uh, what we're doing around town. So uh, we are doing uh, deliveries kind of in the 10 mile give or take radius of Machias. <clears throat> we're also uh, doing deliveries of other sorts uh, while we're out. So if we can help you with uh, groceries or uh, medications or if you need an iPad with a cellular connection so you can uh, FaceTime with your physician, uh, just reach out to us, let us know. Um, on another note, which is very pleasant, uh, we've actually had more people reach out and offer to help us than have needed help. Uh, so I think that's a pretty cool thing about our little community. Um, what else? There are a lot of questions that we've been getting. I think we're probably going to end up just putting them in another video as this one uh, is uh, really pretty long at this point. So, uh, We'll have some contact information in the show notes. Uh, please feel free to reach out. I will try to start uh, addressing some of the questions probably uh, independently, and then I'll bring Dr. Rio back on here, hopefully maybe uh, at the end of the week, uh, uh, assuming he's still vertical. I'm sure it is a pretty uh, difficult week ahead of him. So again, thank you very much for listening. Our contact information will be below, and uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks.